Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate that. We've been looking for this conference for uh, some time, actually since last uh, spring, I think, when it was initially lined up. And so it's good to be with you. We enjoyed our time yesterday, this morning, in adult Bible study. And I've been able to meet a number of you. I haven't met of all of you at fellowship time or before or after. We'd love to meet you, get to know you. It's my first time seeing mountains in the West in a number of years. And so it's beautiful out here. And I'm going to open the trunk, fill it with the sunshine that you have, and take it back to Minnesota. Now, young people don't believe that that's going to work, but I'd sure like to do that. And it's, it's been a blessing to be with you. We appreciate your pastor and Bonnie and their hospitality and getting to know them and their family. I actually had your pastor in a class years ago at Northland. And you'll be glad to know I don't have any bad stories about him, any problems. He, he never had to go to the dean's office, at least that I know of. And so we appreciate him in the ministry. We commend you in the ministry here of what God's done over the years. The pastor has just shared us in summary form some. It's neat to see the great facilities that God has given to you. The ministry that you have here is Grace Baptist Church. And uh, is this called the Utah Valley or what's Salt Lake Valley? Okay. And so it's a blessing to be with you. Let me give you a commercial to begin with. One, I used to teach full-time at Faith Baptist Bible College and uh, Theological Seminary. And we have just a little bit of literature back there. If you're interested, I know you have two students right now at Faith uh, from here. Uh, there's just a little bit of literature back there. And also, one of the, I, will, I teach there at least once a semester, a one-week course. Uh, my favorite course is a little longer than a week. It's um, called The Best of Israel, and uh, there's some flyers back there. If you'd like, I'd encourage you. Uh, to, it's not an expense, it's an investment. It might be a little expensive investment, uh, but we really work to get the price down for this one. Please feel free to pick one of these up. Uh, when we're there, we, use we don't use flannel graph or PowerPoint, we just point and say that's where it happened. And so if you're interested, grab one of these. Uh, there's a website on there. We'd love to have you in the Bible lands with us. Again, thanks for your hospitality, your friendliness. And if I haven't met you yet, please uh, come up and say hi to us. My best friend, my wife, is right back here. If you want to raise your hand. You don't have to stand, Jen, but okay. And we uh, have enjoyed the time with you. Pray for us, if you would, as we journey back to Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, and in the winter, 10 trillion flakes. And so if you would uh, do pray for us as we travel, we would appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, would you turn to Ephesians 5, Ephesians chapter 5, and I know you've already been reminded uh, by way of PowerPoint and the announcements, in Ephesians 5 is probably the passage that uh, people would turn to the most when it comes to God's instruction concerning the home. Uh, when Paul went to Ephesus... Obviously, it was uh, pagan, and they didn't know what was going on. I, I remember the first time I went to uh, the Paul's journeys in the seven churches of Revelation, and we only visited six that time, I think. But I'd been to Israel a number of times, and there you see a lot of uh, scenes that have great truth associated with them. When you go to Greece and Turkey today, you see from the excavations, paganism. In fact, there's a museum I thought after I saw it the first time, I didn't want to take people here on a tour because of some of the uh, pornographic paganism that was manifest. And so when the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he wrote to, or excuse me, yeah, when Paul wrote there to a church at Ephesus, he wrote to a place that had been just steeped in anti-God paganism, no knowledge of God. And so he introduces them to God's great truth concerning his sovereignty, concerning uh, the church. And then he begins to apply it. And so if you can imagine, Paul's writing to people that uh, were just used to living in some ways like animals, as far as their relationships with male, females concerned. And then Paul says, okay, as a believer in Jesus Christ, whatever your background, here is how God wants us to live. And that's the basis. This is just not Paul came up with some new idea. 
This reflects God's intent for the family since Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so as we look at this, realize this is written to a group of people. In a sense, this is all new to them. But I think we're very aware it's all new to our society today. Some of the things we're going to say, so you've got to be kidding. We're well beyond that. Listen, going beyond the Bible, and that's one of the words for sin in the Old Testament, going beyond uh, the boundaries of the Bible is not advance. It's going backwards. It's not uh, things are evolving. It's devolving. It's going backwards. So when we look at Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at what God says to a society that wants nothing to do, in a sense, with God and His thought about man and wife and parents and children. But this is the way God intends it. This is what's best. This is the way it ought to be. Let me just say, and I'm not trying to be negative, but if you live according to the Bible, and as Paul summarizes it, you're going to be counterculture. But you know what, there are people out there that are so sick of lifestyles that are perverted and know nothing about what life's supposed to be like. When they detect and they see a real Christian home, it really attracts them. Because their conscience, though it may be warped, is on the side of a Christian home. Because they know that's what it ought to be like. And so when we look at Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at that which is the eternal truth from God that he waited to give the Apostle Paul until he wrote to this church at Ephesus. One preacher preached through Ephesians and he called roses in a garbage dump. In other words, uh, here are people that are coming up from the midst of raw paganism and corruption and here are beautiful roses growing there. I want you, uh, by God's grace, and my wife and I where we live, to be roses in a... Kind of a garbage dump of paganism. So let's look at a couple of verses and then we'll pray. Let me just read the verse 25, 26, and 27. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Now can you imagine yourself being described like this? This is your future. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That is your future as a believer. And it's all based upon what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. What a future we have. No wonder we should say, you know, if I have to live counterculture and seem, quote unquote, odd, no problem. Because that's what God wants me to do, to show people there is something really attractive. Not everything's dark, not everything's corrupt in this society. Before we look at Ephesians 5, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for, in your grace, condescending to give us your very mind, your very heart. Describing your character, who you are. Describing what it's like to manifest God, to shine as lights in a dark age. Thank you for Grace Baptist Church and for pastor and assistant pastor and their families and for the people of this church. Encourage us, motivate us. By your word this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I use a term, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, or the control of the Holy Spirit, what do you think? You think, okay, I think of uh, great evangelistic meetings, great revival meetings, missionaries seeing a multitude of people saved. I think of uh, great movements of God, great things happening for God when I think about the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the control of the Holy Spirit. Well, that certainly is an evidence of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But when God commanded us to be filled with the Spirit, and then showed what it's like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he chose to talk about the home. You say, what? Yes. I just want to take us, by God's grace, through Ephesians chapter 5, 18. Actually, we're going to go into 6, verse 4. Actually, the context ends in chapter 6 and verse 9. Let's work our way through there to see what it means to be spirit-filled. Spirit control is nothing mystical. It doesn't cause you to jump up and down, roll somersaults in the aisle, and stand your head and gargle peanut butter. It, it's nothing like that. It's the fact 
that we say to the Lord, the characteristic of the age in which we live is when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. A third member of the Trinity comes to live within us. How does that work? I don't know, but God does. Okay? And so when we become a believer, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell in us. Every single believer is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The moment he's saved, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. But the filling of the Holy Spirit means he controls us. And we're all very aware that the fullness of the Holy Spirit is not always our experience. Being controlled by the Holy Spirit is yielding. You say, what do I have to do to work this thing? You don't work it up. You yield, and by faith know that when I yield myself to the Lord, the Holy Spirit not only lives within me, He controls me. That's why it's so crucial. That's when the disciples said, Is it time for the kingdom in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6? And Jesus in verse 7 says, God's got that all planned. All the prophecies planned, and He's revealed more to us in the New Testament. He said, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. It is characteristic that people of the age in which we live are, are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. But it is our responsibility, no, it's our privilege to constantly, every day, throughout the day, submit to the Spirit's control. There's nothing mystical about it. It's just taking God as word. And he, you're not led contrary to the Bible, okay? The Holy Spirit's the author of Scripture. Have you heard people say some things? They said, well, the Holy Spirit led me to do this. You say, what? Where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from the Holy Spirit. If it's contrary to this book, because he authored it for us. It's our direction. Ephesians is authored by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul so that we might know what God has done for us in Christ, so that we might live for the Lord, in particular, what we're considering this morning, the family. So I want us to consider a command. I want us to consider the evidences of the command. And then I want us to consider the application of that command. What it says in essence for us, we need to demonstrate we're controlled by the Holy Spirit in our home. You say, wait a minute. My kids know me. My wife knows me. My husband knows me. And I think they know if I'm spirit-controlled or not. If I'm following Scripture by the direction of the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what we need to know. So let's look at the command, first of all, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Here's what it says. And be, there, there's a negative and a positive. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine. That's the negative. When a person's drunk, maybe you've seen this, maybe you've experienced it in the past, hopefully in the past, uh, well, or you've experienced it at some time or another. You've, have you observed a drunk person before? They may come to a curb, and it's like this high, but they go way up like this and go. Their speech is affected. All kinds are affected. They could come up to a guy that's, you know, seven, eight. Well, I don't know too many people like that. And I'm taking you on when they're about five, four. And you, they, what's wrong? They are controlled by something else. And in this case, has a negative effect upon their thinking and upon their actions. That's an, don't be like that. Don't be controlled by the foreign substance. When the Holy Spirit first came, as He did, and began this time in which we live on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 13, these people knew something was different about these individuals. They weren't doing things sinful. They were talking in the languages of all people that were gathered in the day of Pentecost. Every child, every man that is 12 years and above has three feasts he's responsible to go to. And it tells us in the Old Testament, God would protect them. And all the males came down to Jerusalem. One is Passover, followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The other in the fall, it's the Feast of Tabernacles. But the middle one is the Feast of Pentecost. So you have here in Israel, all the males from out different areas come in from all different countries. And on the day of Pentecost, I believe at the southern wall of the temple, this house, not the upper room, believe me, 3,000 people weren't gathered there. At this house, the house... The Holy Spirit came, and they said in Acts 2.13, These people are filled with wine. 
Peter said, no, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. They may not be able to say that today. But uh, then these people are not drunk. They're not filled with wine. But it's the positive we're talking about. It was introduced that the Holy Spirit indwelt believers. Don't be filled with wine. That's a negative. But what are we to be filled with? Or actually, literally, be consistently, constantly being controlled by. Note, but be filled with the Spirit. Again, it's not mystical. Uh, in Colossians, the application of Colossians is as a twin to Ephesians. If you'll read Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 18, and then read the effects, and you go to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, and read the effects, you'll say it's the same thing. Only one says, be filled with the Spirit. The other one says, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. There's nothing mystical about it. It's just, I am submitting myself to obey God. But the way to do it is that the Holy Spirit does it through me. So, it's nothing mystical. It's, I'm committed to fulfilling Scripture and obeying Scripture. But the Holy Spirit is the one that God has given. He indwells me. When He controls me, I obey. So there's the command. The negative, be not drunk with wine where it is excess. The positive, be filled with the Spirit. Yield yourselves daily, hourly to the Holy Spirit to control your lives. Secondly, the Apostle Paul shows the effect, and this is how it happens, I don't want to be technical, but grammatically. And you say, wait a minute, this is church, so let's not talk about grammar, okay? Well, uh, it's important that we do the command, and then he gives three evidences of that command. So the t context didn't stop when he talked about being filled with the Spirit. He said, here are three evidences of that. He gives the first evidence, if you will look at verse 19, and we may call that evidence the uh, emotional or joy, if we want to call it that. Note verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in hymns, or psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The first evidence of being controlled by the Spirit, and it's just the way that the Apostle Paul wrote it, is a joy, the emotional response. It's you sing to yourself, you sing with us as we did today. You say, you know, I really don't sing. Maybe in the shower once in a while. Well, nobody's home, but I, I don't sing that way. I shared with a couple yesterday, I'm like the guy in jail. I'm always behind a few bars hunting for the right key. Uh, the first time I heard somebody say that, yeah, that's, that's, that's where it is. So you say, I really can't sing. It's not talking about the fact that you have an ability to do great uh, performances. And we're not talking about that. It's talking about the fact that for control of the Holy Spirit, there is a joy there that is manifest in song. We're willing and glad to sing about it. I heard an individual say, and unfortunately it prejudices my mind, what is joy? It's a godly optimism. When we're controlled with the Holy Spirit, here, know what it says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, seeking and making, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There's an evidence of joy, singing, praise, whatever you want to call that. Secondly, there's what we may call an intellectual evidence or the evidence of thanksgiving. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You just love to be around somebody that's an ingrate, right? It's always complaining, never thankful for what he or she has. Everything's wrong, nothing's right. You know, obviously that person is not spirit-filled. Thanksgiving is a declaration of dependence. It's, Lord, you've provided so many things for me, and I'm thankful for it. There's a sentence in the New Testament. We sort of divide it up because it's divided into verses. But there's a sentence that ends this way. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Thankful for everything. Maybe you've heard about the couple that were in the big city and they were from the farm or the ranch. And uh, they were in a restaurant and they bowed their head and thanked God for the food. Some wise individual wanted to demean them, came up to them and said, Everybody do that where you're from? He said, Nope, the pigs don't. You know, I remember reading years ago about a missionary in the South Sea Isles. And he was learning the language. And he discovered their language did not have a word for thanks in it. A person in whom the Spirit of God is working realizes what I have. It may be less than other individuals, but every provision, everything that I have is from God and is thankful. Be filled with the Spirit. There's a praise that results from that. There's a thanks that rejoices, that comes from that and rejoices 
But the third evidence of the Holy Spirit is what we may call the devotional, the act of the will. In verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. How's that look? Well, can you hold your finger here and look at Philippians chapter 2? Philippians, it's just the next book over, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, and by the way, it is. He's, he's, he's assuming it is because the way it's worded, it is. If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels, and you say it's rather inelegant, it's just talking about the depth of your being in mercies. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man at his own things, but every man on the things of others. In other words, you're submitting to one another in a practical way. To some people, it may come as a shock. And I say this with tongue in cheek, but some people have ideas that are equal or better than ours. You say, Really? I know you don't say that. But sometimes we get the idea, you know, at a business meeting or a members meeting, I love that title, that's a great title, members meeting. You know, a recommendation is given, somebody comes up with an idea and, and other ideas and the pastor and, and others bring up the idea. And you say, what? You've got to be kidding because my idea is so much better than theirs, even though they've researched and studied. And you, you see what I'm saying? And you, you hear other individuals. It's like if you said, if we'd have been Adam and Eve, we wouldn't have sinned. We wouldn't have eaten the fruit, whatever it was. It wasn't the problem with the fruit. It was a pear in the ground. Uh, that was the problem. He said, if we'd have been Adam and Eve, we wouldn't have raised Cain. You go on and on and on because our ideas, obviously, you, you know where I'm going with this. And it is really hard to submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. Now, there are three evidences that he gave the Holy Spirit. One might be our emotions, the praise and so on. The other, mind, thanksgiving. The other, submitting to one another. Paul, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, could have chosen any one of those three to expand upon. He expanded upon the third one. In fact, note the flow of thought from verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another to fear the Lord. And then he says, verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. That is what God chose to emphasize when he talked about the control of the Holy Spirit being manifest in a practical way in our home. He says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Husbands, submit yourselves to the Lord on the behalf of your family. Children, submit yourselves to your parents. The command, the evidences, let's look at the application, okay? Can we look at the application of this? Now I realize when we apply it to the wife, to the husband, to the children, when we apply to the wife, it's off the charts as far as society is concerned. There's nothing wrong with it. It's great. It's beautiful. Note what he says in three verses. Beginning in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. This is an attitude as, as much as it is an action. It is an action. But it's an attitude, first of all. If you're controlled by the Holy Spirit, you'll be submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. And the first point of the application is, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. The requirement is given in verse 22. And let me just ask you a question. Ladies, you say, oh, I knew you would say this about submission and everything. No, I didn't. Paul did. But I'm repeating what Paul had to say, okay? So uh, I'm ducking and let you give it to Paul. No. You give it to God, okay? You say, I'm not going to do that. Let me ask you the question. How do you think you should submit to the Lord, ladies? Well, okay, if that's what you want. You know, I'm not sure this is good. I'm not sure it's a very good idea. But if you say, you say no, no. I, I'm not going to approach the Lord like that. Paul says in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. This does not mean the woman is inferior. 
It means this is God's order. Let's take the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you need help like me, it's just before 2 Corinthians. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And note verse 3. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I would have you know, 1 Corinthians 3 says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. You say, what? The head of Christ is God. When we consider the Trinity, and I'll do this really fast, there are three aspects we have to consider. One is, we call it the essence. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are equal. Baptize them in the names of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Mm -mm. The name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are equal. But there's another manifestation of the Trinity in the Bible. We may call it the administrative aspect. The Father plans, the Son provides, the Holy Spirit executes. It's three equal people. But the Scripture shows us that they function together, beautiful unity together, as equals but they carry out different responsibilities. And the third aspect is Jesus is the incarnate Son of God. Jesus didn't cease to be God when he became God and man at the same time. He just said there are certain things as God that I won't exercise when I'm here on earth. And that's why he says the Father is greater than me. He only says that. You only read that when he's the incarnate Son, when he's the God-man in the flesh. Here in 1 Corinthians 11.3, it says, God is the head of Christ. What is that talking about? That's how they function as members of the Trinity. They're no less equal to each other. They are equal. Okay? Now, are men and women equal? You say, no. When I was in grade school, and even in high school, the girls got a lot better grades than I did. You're still equal. But you say, I don't know what it was. Now, maybe that's not true of everyone, but, you know, they say, I always did that. Men and women are equal, just like the Father and Son are equal. But God gave a procedure in the order of creation. Even when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, 12, 13, 14, God gave an order that he created man first. Man is the head. Man has a responsibility. He's not to be a tyrant. He's not to be cruel. He's not to be unkind, as we'll see in a little bit. But God gave man as a leader in the home. And so wives, it says in verse 22, here's a requirement. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands is unto the Lord. How would you say, I want to submit to the Lord? Now, your husband is not God. You understand that. But it's the same sweet spirit, and it's the same recognition God gave me. The husband is ahead to lead our home, and I will sweetly submit to him. Here's the reason in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. That's the reason. God made the husband the head. Back to the requirement again, verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ... So let the wives be their own husbands in everything. Should the church say to the Lord, you're my leader and we want to do what you want me to do? Your mission statement, your approach, your pastor's preaching, teaching, and so on. He said, you know, I was reading Reader's Digest the other day and we got a really neat new idea for our church. We'll present it in the next members meeting. You say, I'm out of here. You, you, that's not what he does. He says, the Bible says, our church needs to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave us the Bible to follow. The church submits to the Lord Jesus Christ. Husband and wife, as we'll see in a bit, are a beautiful picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. The church and church us say, Lord, you've given us your word. We submit to you because we want to honor you. There's nothing cruel or unkind about this. It's that we submit to the Lord as wives, as a church would to Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to the second point of the application, and that's the husband. And by the way, there's more said to the husband than there is to the wife. 
when it comes to this. What is a husband? He's to provide loving leadership. Note what it says in Ephesians 25 as we... Uh, 525, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, husbands, love your wives. What does that mean? If we take our typical media presentation of a husband loving his wife, it's like puppy love. And that's the problem. A lot of times, a friend of mine, in fact, he was president, I think when Pastor Matt was there, would say a lot of people don't get married for love. At first, it's like puppy love. And if it stays there, you've heard puppy love leads to a dog's life, and that's exactly what happens. If that's all it is, if it's just a sensational feeling and whatever, you've got problems. Romantic love is great, and cultivate that. Take your wife where they can't afford electricity, and they only have candles. But uh, just do what the Bible says. Re remember the first time you... Uh, held your wife's hand the first time you kissed your wife you said you know what it was sort of like grabbing a positive electrical fence because things went up my arm and things went up my spine and fireworks set off and all kinds of things happened and it was just amazing sensational and then we were married married two or three years and you say I don't know who did it, but somebody came in and turned the voltage down just a little bit. You know, if you're only depending upon physical sensation, if you're only depending upon infatuation as a basis of a marriage relationship, we're in deep trouble. It's not just a matter of, ooh, the feelings and the fireworks and all the sensations and everything going off. So when the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church... It's not just talking about physical sensations. It's not just talking about the fact that things are kind of giddy. In fact, now please listen to me. This would almost be irreverent if we said Christ loves the church like that. That's not the way he loves the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for. What is Bible love? If it's not things going up and down my spine. And, you know, as soon as that stops, the typical media says, well, it's all over. You've got to find someone else that does the same thing for you again. That's living like an animal. It's not living like a Christian. We need to do what the Bible says. Love. The word for love here, it's an intelligent, thoughtful choice to do what's best for another person. Husbands, we are to love our wives. May I just review a little bit with one more word that I did yesterday. It's a choice. Now, that sounds really cold, doesn't it? So don't rule out the romance. Don't rule out all this other stuff. But when somebody turns the voltage down, it's a choice. And it ought to be a choice from the beginning. I am going to make my mate special. And I'm committed to her needs. It's a choice. It is unconditional. See, that's where the problems come in. Well, she ever doesn't make the bed in the morning. If she ever doesn't make my favorite breakfast when I come home. If she ever burns a meal. If she doesn't do the laundry. If she doesn't do the wash. That's conditional love. It's not I will love you if. It's I love you. Can you imagine Jesus Christ exercising conditional love? You say, no. Now, obviously we need to obey him, and he loves us, so he chastens us. But it's not conditional love. He's committed to us and our well-being. It's not only a choice, it's not only unconditional, it's based on the character of the one saying this, the one loving. I said yesterday, let me just repeat it. If you say, I don't love you, that's not a bad reflection upon them. It's a bad reflection upon me because love is an expression of character. God so loved the world that he gave. And I'm telling you, the world was shaking their fist and rebellion at him and hatred toward him, perverting his character, perverting his truth. And God loved the world. If we love, it's a demonstration of Christian character. It's an evidence. Where are we now in this whole thing? The fruit of the Spirit is love. If I'm controlled by the Holy Spirit as a man, then I love my wife unconditionally.
conditionally. But there's a fourth word that comes up here in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's sacrificial. Would you, I remember one time we had a, the first, when I pastored my first church, and I went back and pastored again after 27 years, but we had our first, I don't know if it was our first members meeting, we had a meeting and we were discussing the doctrine of carpet color. Well, it seemed like it was a doctrine of carpet, it was blue versus red. And let me tell you something, it was not pretty. Neither blue nor red was pretty. Uh, the ones that were standing, it got really tough. In fact, I really just left the meeting and God took over and Red got the thing and everybody was happy with it. But in the process of that, a man came out to me and I, he was maybe blue, I don't know. Anyway, he came out to me and he said this. He said, uh, it's one thing to say that I would love you. He said, it's another thing to say I would die for you. And he said, I would die for you. That's something to a young preacher to hear words like that. It was amazing for somebody to say something like that. It's one thing for a husband to say to your wife, I love you. It's another thing to say to your wife, I'd die for you. Jesus Christ so loved the church, his people, that he died for them. Men, well, I don't think it's hard for wives at all to submit to a husband that loves them like that. Now, it's not perfect, but it's a sacrificial love. And I'd say, ladies, right away, it's not hard for a husband to love like that when a woman has a sweet, submissive spirit. And that, see, you're submitting yourselves one to another. See, that's the evidence of being filled with the Spirit. And so the requirement for the husband, the exhortation is to love his wife. The illustration is Christ in his church. And then he elaborates upon that. Husbands, love your wives, but did Christ just save you and say, okay, you're on your own now, we'll see you in heaven. That's not the way he does it. Christ saves us, then he invests in us. He leads us, he controls us, he works circumstances that are not all good. Try to go to heaven on beds of ease? No. Songwriter knew what was going on. So note what Jesus does for his church. It says in verse 26, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. When Jesus Christ saves us out of love, he gave himself a sacrifice. And this is, the, this is where it all begins. Realizing I'm a sinner. I don't deserve eternal life, but Jesus Christ is God's provision. He came to this earth. He died on the cross. He shed his blood. He rose again that I might have everlasting life. That's a gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. God's only provision. I trust him alone. When you trust Him as personal Savior, then He begins working in your life. He brings circumstance to your life, and it's all according to Scripture. You keep coming back to Scripture. He does it by the Word. It says in John 15, in verse 3, You're clean by the Word which I've spoken unto you. The effect of the Word of God is we just immerse ourselves in the Word of God. He's constantly investing in our life, so we grow. So He brings us to the place, what we call the rapture, in verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it might be holy and without blemish. Husbands, we love our wives. We need to tell our wives. But we need to invest in our wives, in their interest. Sometimes we say, you can have Saturday morning off, or Saturday off, and I'll stay home with the kids after the smelling salts and you pick her up. Uh, then you say, no, I, I really, I, I want you to just uh, have the day. You say, my wife likes scrapbooking, my wife likes stamping, whatever, and it may be sewing, it may be quilting. I saw that you have that. Many things. Invest in her interests, invest in the gifts that God has given her. Jesus Christ does that after we're saved, and so we ought to do that in the lives of our wives, that we show an interest in them. It's really spontaneous almost for the wife to invest in the husband. My wife uses a phrase, she said, and she talks to us, I'm his cheerleader. And she's a good one, encouragement and a blessing. We need to be the same thing for our wives. Jesus Christ loved us and saved us and invest in us, in our lives. We need to do the same thing for our wives. She likes stamping, you go buy her stamp. Probably be wrong, but you'll really appreciate it. You know, you say, wait, this, wait, it's Christmas, not Easter, but okay, I, anyway. But 
invest in her interests in her lives because God's given her those interests, but interest in her life personally. And then he continues like this when he says in verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Does that sound familiar? The greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The best way to love your neighbor as you love yourself is to follow what has been called for years the golden rule. What is the golden rule? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. If your neighbor next to you broke his leg and the leaves have fallen, rake him so they don't blow over into your yard. No, just rake him because that's what your neighbor, you'd want your neighbor to do to you if you had the broken leg. It's very simple. It just lays it out. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Your wife invests in you. You invest in your wife. You treat her as your own body. Now listen to this. For every man, for no man ever hated his own flesh. Verse 29, but nourish and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, Genesis twenty-two twenty-four, 24, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Husbands, we need, verse 29, to nourish and cherish our wives. The Bible calls them the weaker vessel, not because they're intellectually deficient or morally deficient or deficient in their character or their person or anything else. But God put us as a protector. He put us as a leader. And we need to nourish and cherish our wives. That's a time of investment in their best. That is love. Now, why is Paul doing this in such an amazing epistle as Ephesians? He's writing to these pagans that say, wow, that's new there at Ephesus. He says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. He says, you're going to demonstrate before a world that knows nothing about the true God of heaven. You're going to demonstrate what it's like to be related to Jesus Christ and have a relationship with Him. When they look at your relationship with your wife and say, what is this? It comes because I'm related to Christ. I've trusted Him personally. And I want to emulate His character. As Christ loves the church, and the wife says, I want to submit to my husband, as the church submits to Christ. And so verse 33 says, Nevertheless, let every man of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. That is a beautiful, beautiful illustration to an unsaved world of a relationship between Christ and the believer. There's a third point of application. We're filled with the Spirit. There are three evidences. The evidence Paul picks up on by inspiration is submitting yourselves to one another. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Husbands, submit to the Lord and love your wives sacrificially. But it also says to the children, what you're to do actively as children. How many of you say... Ephesians 6, 1 is one of the first verses I memorized, or my parents made me memorize or whatever. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Did any of you, you ever hear your parents say that? Any of you children? Obey your parents for this is right. Well, what does the Bible say when it comes, the requirement is to obey? How many of you chose your parents? I don't care if you're a grandparent, a parent, or whatever. There's, even if it's by adoption. How do you chose your parents? You say, no, but only one person chose his parents. That was Jesus Christ. And he came right down to earth in common humanity, just like the rest of us. He's the only one that ever chose his parents. God chose your parents. You say, did he make a mistake? No. Maybe children have mistaken thinking when they think, I'm smarter than my parents. And sometimes they're really restrictive. Why don't, want they, why don't they want me to play in the street? Why don't they want me to play the rattlesnakes? Uh, and you say, well, that's pretty common. I understand that. Okay, why don't they want me to hang out with these people? Why don't they want me to go there with them? Why don't they want me to associate with these individuals in life? For the same reason they didn't want you to play in the street, the same reason they didn't want you to play with rattlesnakes, only it's not physical, it's spiritual. They don't want you killed. They don't want you ruined. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right and God gave you your parents. So the first requirement is obey. And if they love you, 
You say, you know, they have my best interest in view. Even though sometimes it seems like, boy, they missed out on a generation or two. Uh, you know, something's wrong. No. They, God gave him experience. He didn't give teens to raise teens. He didn't give kids to raise parents. He gave parents to raise children. So obey your parents, for this is right. Then he says, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. What does it mean to honor your parents? It means to value them, to respect them, to highly esteem them, to really value them. Where'd that come from? It came from the Ten Commandments. There are four commandments that directly talk about our relationship to God. There are five commandments that talk about directly our relationship to other people. But there is what may be called a hinge commandment that deals about how do I write, relate rightly to God, how do I rate, relate rightly to people. I learn it from my parents because they bring me up to the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Honor your parents. Value them. Say they are precious. They are super important in my life. It's the first commandment with promise. Now, I did this for just a little section of time in my son's life, and I would set it up, and I would uh, uh, ask, they say, ask John what he wants to be when he grows up. And they'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up? When you grow up, and he said, alive. Now, it's based on this passage right here. Honor your parents that your days may be long on the earth. Now, that's more than just a funny little thing, really. That's serious stuff. The Ten Commandments say that's the first commandment given with promise. How's that work? You respect your parents, you honor your parents, you value them. When Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross and shedding his blood and suffering and agony and pain and rejection, he came into his own, his own received him not. And even being rejected by God when he said, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? You've heard of the seven sayings on the cross. One of the seven sayings on the cross, Jesus Christ, the God-man, suffering for our sins, looks at John and says, Behold your mother. He looks at Mary and says, Behold your son. Suffering and agony on the cross, he honored his mother. When you go to Ephesus today, there are two churches. We don't name our churches like this, but there are two churches. One is called St. John. The other is called St. Mary. And I haven't seen much of churches but ruins, but I sure like to see the baptistries in them uh, because they were both had baptistries in them and that was for immersion there in the church at Ephesus. But you say, okay, I can understand St. John because he went to minister at Ephesus. In fact, he wrote to them, the book of Revelation, one of the churches. What's this thing of St. Mary? Because Jesus honored his mother on the cross. And John took the responsibility of caring for Mary the rest of her life because Jesus honored his parents. And both of them lived and died and are remembered in Ephesus. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Children, honor your parents. But one more thing, that's what you do actively but passively. Fathers... Verse 4, you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Don't, don't be unreasonable. Be encouraging. I'd like to do it over again with my children. Because sometimes I'm the parent and they're going to do it. God gave parents to love their children as they would love their wives. It's different because the children leave the home after we set the example and teach them how to live as adults and how to establish an independent home. Don't be harsh. Don't be cruel. Sometimes we have the thing, how come you don't like, act like an adult? There's a reason. They're not. Okay, they need to be trained. Now, they ought not be disobedient and so on, and we ought to lovely and correct them. But they're children. And they need to be brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And that's both parents, but the Father has a responsibility, both of them to love our children so much that we make decisions for them, and sometimes they get older with them, that are with their best interest in view, that they say, you hate me, you don't love me, you won't let me do anything. I know I'm speaking to an audience that's never done this before, but, you know, for other people that have done that, you know, we need to make guidance and the decisions for our children that are best for them. Don't provoke them to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord.
In other words, that verse says, and let me take it, I'm going to be done here just a bit, but let me, there's something that I think is extremely crucial. We need to disciple our children, our wives and our children. One of the hardest things my wife ever said to me when I left the last church and we established on its fifth anniversary, she said, you're not going to be my pastor anymore. That's why I haul around in the United States in these conferences. No, but uh, she said, you're not going to be my pastor anymore. She, in some ways, among many witnesses, was discipled as I taught the Word of God, besides personally. Disciple your wives. Disciple your children. We read the Great Commission, which unfortunately has become the Great Omission. It's to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's not the Great Commission. That's part of it. It says, teach them to observe all things, what's where I've commanded you. And there's only one way. We can teach them. Unsaved people can teach the commands. I mean, and explain what this verb means and that. And I mean, I'm not recommending that, but they can do that. But they can't teach them to observe all things. That comes by being a role model. And might I take just a few minutes to talk about that? When it says, bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, we can train them all we want and we ought to, and we can teach them all we want. But we better model the truth. Can I take just a couple more minutes and have you turn to Psalm 12, 8? And then one more passage and then we're done. Psalm 12 and verse 8. An acquaintance of mine, he's a friend really, established an organization called Proteins. And we had him when I was pastoring in Alaska, and he spoke about his church. And he said, I don't know why he did this. 13 points. There are 13, ways of, 13 philosophical points for our church. And one of them was based on Psalm 12, verse 8. Note Psalm 12 and verse 8. Psalm 12, 8. Are you there? Psalm 12, 8. The wicked walk on every hand when the vilest men are exalted. The point of philosophy for his church was, you get what you honor. You get what you honor. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. Who are the typical role models of teens today? We say, that's no problem. You walk in their room and there's a... We, we, the, the photos are really bad, but there's the Apostle Paul. And there's Peter. And there is Philip the Evangelist. And there... You say, no. I wish that were true. Would you turn me to Philippians 3? And that'll be the last passage we look at. Philippians chapter 3. Like Ephesus, Philippi is in Greece. And those people really didn't know what it was like to live as a believer. And so the Apostle Paul says this in verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. Paul's not promoting Paul, he's promoting Christ's likeness. Be followers together of me and mark them which walk as ye have us for an example. He said, role models are necessary. At the church at Philippi, it is crucial that people said, what does it look like in flesh and blood for somebody to live like a Christian? And then he gave the reason why there needs to be role models. Verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and tell you even weeping that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. He said, if you look at Philippi, which was a Roman colony, and they had all the privileges of Roman citizenship, he said, you look at Philippi where Roman generals retired in Philippi. And you look at the lifestyles of these people. You don't want to live like that. You want to live like Jesus Christ. But he elaborates. Note what he says in verse 19. Whose end is destruction. Let me ask you a question. You walk into the room of a typical teenager today. What are the posters on the wall? Somebody that's a rock star. Somebody that lives a short life because of their doing drugs, their immoral lifestyles, their hatred and their venom against God and righteousness. Or there's some team, and I realize there's some nice sports players, but I heard one person say one time, I'm tired of being more loyal than players are to their team. And a little more money, and then pretty soon, even sometimes great role models, they get caught up in lifestyles, and you find out what the underbelly of them are, and you say, I don't want them like that. Why? Because they're into destruction. I'm going to be very frank to you. Do you want your children to have as their role models people that are going to hell? You say, no. That's what Paul's saying here. He said, 
Follow people that live like I did because that's how Jesus Christ would live. There are plenty of people that are enemies across the Christ whose end is destruction, no, whose God is their belly, they just to follow their own desires, whose glory is their shame. Tomorrow morning you'll talk to people at work and they brag about all the stuff they did over the weekend. And you say, I don't want my kids to live like that. Their glory is their shame. Why? Because here, who mind earthly things. Their whole life is just filled with earth. And that's our society. If you went back 56 years ago, even in our own society, there would be people that had a, a, a semblance of the fear of God. But today, Paul says to the church at Philippi, please follow people that live like Jesus Christ. He says, don't follow people that are going to hell. Don't follow people who just follow their desires or God's their belly. And what they glory and what they brag about on Monday morning is really shameful. Because they're only looking at life from an earthly perspective. Now, what are we to be like? Parents, bring your children up in the nurture of the admonition of the Lord. So they not only get taught from you. It's not only taught, it's caught. Because you model truth for them. Paul didn't finish Philippians 3 yet. Note what he says. These people mind only earthly things. He says, for our conversation, literally, our citizenship. And they knew what it was like because they knew what it was like to live and had the privileges in Philippi. Not every place had the privilege of Roman citizenship and all the benefits. He said, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall, mind our, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. Parents, I plead with you, I plead with myself. Don't live, don't teach, don't model, as if earthly things are all there are in life. Paul said to the Philippians, don't follow people who are purely earth-centered and all their standards and all their thoughts come from the media, come from this, come from that, come from what you observe in the city of Philippi. He said, model people or who are so heavenly minded that they are of earthly good. Set your affection on things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Children need parents that not only bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord by having them taught, but it's by what they catch. They're not only taught, they're caught. Model not person whose lives are filled with this earth and the things of this earth, but people whose lives. I love Jesus Christ. I want to serve Jesus Christ. I want my children to be brought upright, and I want to teach them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, but I want them to know that mom and dad live that way. If we're filled with the Spirit, we submit one to another. Wives submit to their husbands. Husbands submit to Christ and love their wives sacrificially. And children realize God gave them the parents they have. And they obey Him. And they honor Him. And then we keep perpetuating that to the next generation. Being filled with the Spirit can be great evangelistic meetings, can be great revival meetings, can be great missions meetings. But being filled with the Spirit, according to Paul, via the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us is have a God-centered home. Let's pray.